Hey guys, remember when I used to talk about writing and reading stuff? <coughs> well, now we're finally going back to that, but unfortunately, yes, I'm gonna start it off with a rantish type of deal. Trust me, when it comes to what I've been working on as far as writing has been concerned, you'll understand. So this semester of my last year at this college, I am taking a class called Creative Writing Portfolio, and it's basically the class that basically means I'm showing off my writing skills, for which I have learned for the past three or four years that I've been at this school. And considering I'm an English major, who probably would have gone into a creative writing emphasis if it had, if it had existed here, this is basically probably my capstone. Yeah, capstone or thesis. Thesis is only for honors students, which I am not. So anyway, for this portfolio writing class, my professor gave the whole class, well, each student, an option to write about whatever they wanted, or 20 to 55 pages of whatever medium they so desired, which means short stories, or poetry, or nonfiction, whatever they so desired, they have to write 20 to 55 pages of that as their final project. And this is what we're working on for the rest of the semester. Being the overachiever that I am, I decided I was gonna write part of a novel for my portfolio project. Well, not only because I'm an overachiever, but that's also what I really want to pursue in my adult life. So why the hell not? Not only do we have to um, start writing these things that we're going to be presenting on, or not exactly presenting, but we're going to hand in to our professor at the end of the semester, we also have to read books that relate to our work that we have been writing on, and we have to keep track of that reading in our reading journals. And no, this is not a shameless plug to go listen to Cartland Audio. I just coincidentally bought his notebooks over the summer and now I'm using it to write this in. So the reading journal is not that hard. Trust me, because I'm the type of person who if I would read for a career, I would have taken that job in a heartbeat because I do more reading than most college students nowadays. But with the um, reading that I have been doing, I have to read books that would either relate to what genre I am writing, which is a science fiction fantasy, or I have to read books about characters that would relate to my characters. So for the most part of the reading that I have been doing, I have been trying to find books that have strong female leads and strong male leads because my main characters are both male and female, or vice versa. And the best way that I could find that is not only read through science fiction slash fantasy books, but it's also read young adult fiction because my characters are under the age of 18, but anything from teenager to college student is considered young adult fiction, so I really should not be contradicting myself here. While doing this reading journal process, it made me realize, God, I had to be one of the dumbest readers of all time to think that the majority of young adult fiction that I've been reading, which was considered popular, were actually any good. But I was wrong. Okay, maybe I wasn't that dumb of a reader because, look, we were all teenagers at some point and we all, and if there was any reading that we wanted to get done, of course we went to the young adult section because we were too old for the kids section and we were not mentally mature enough for the adult books, even though some teenage friends that I had went to the adult section to pick out um, some science fiction or mystery books that were really popular for adults. But I was a complete romance nerd when I was a teenager. Romance was like the one genre that I loved writing in. And 
along with dystopian or fantasy, but I really loved romance because I loved researching how it was possible for two people who probably have never seen each other until that moment got together. I mean, yes, I was that person who would read Nicholas Sparks novels and cry. I didn't think that would actually come back to haunt me in college, but say what you will, Col college friends who know me, it's happening. And this, I guess, Cher's rant is more about God, people don't know how to write teenagers nowadays, don't they? They probably haven't done it in the past and they still don't now. For example, one of the books I had to read for the reading journal here was a young adult novel that came out about a year or two ago called What to Say Next. And by reading the first few pages, I thought it was interesting because one main character one of the main characters, the guy character, is diagnosed with autism. And I'm like, okay, this is interesting. We don't meet a lot of teen characters who go through the struggles with autism and how society treats them. So I thought, why not for one thing? And then the female character is a popular girl whose father had passed away in a car crash, so she's trying to adjust while her friends technically don't understand what's happening. And I thought, this sounds like a stereotypical, like, young adult novel plot for this character, but I thought, hey, why not? Like, I'll bite. But mostly for the male character, not the female character. But then, okay, how this book starts is actually pretty decent. It's like, the two meet because it starts at after this girl's father died, and she's trying to avoid everybody else. So she decides that she's going to sit at the same lunch table as the guy who has autism, who's basically the very social outcast of this school. Then it also starts with them, or the guy actually trying to make awkward conversation. Because, like, from what I've read, this is the guy who has a level of autism who's that's not so high functioning but he is super intelligent but it's just when he's stuck in social situations it's not as um what's the word that i could say for this that won't offend every single goddamn person in the universe oh yeah it's not as street smart that it is book smart and i am saying that trying to say that in the nicest way possible honestly so he starts off the conversation with hey your, I heard your father passed away. And of course, the girl does not expect him to say that, but her response is, yeah, he did. And then his response to that is, I'm sorry. And then her response is like, yeah, it's fine. Like how we always like try to um, close, close ourselves off when we really don't feel like talking. But it's funny how a little conversation like that could get someone who really doesn't want to um, face their own social clique to actually confide in someone who's not in their social clique, like how the girl is confiding in the guy when it comes to her present situation. So when the first half of the book started out like that, it was great. Like, the character interactions were pretty great, even though, like, the school scenario reminds me of every fucking Disney Channel's high school movie I've ever seen in my life. Completely unrealistic. But I thought I could let that go. But then we get to the second half of the book, and that is when I lost all my faith in this story in general. Because then we get to the plot, and then I start thinking, this is not how high school actually rolls. So in the middle of the book, the main lead gets bullied even further because he had a notebook that he jot down notes about everyone in the school but one of the main girl's friends found it and decided to create a blog post of the things that were written in the journal basically to get everyone in the school to beat the living shit out of the main male lead and unfortunately that is a more realistic scenario because bullying can go that far and it has gone that far or worse but then how the school handles it is that one day 
The main lead almost gets the crap beaten out of him, but then out of something that snaps in his brain, he fights back out of self-defense, which... Of course, it's normal. If you're in that situation, now how do you not fight back? But then, the principal decides he was going to defend the group of bullies who were about to beat the living shit out of him in public, and he was about to expel the main lead because he actually was the one who showed violence. Welcome to 2016-17! That shit would not go down in real life. I mean, thank god the main character di ended up not getting expelled because the main female lead was actually there when the situation happened and she defended him. Like, thank Christ. But literally though, the consideration of the principal trying to expel a student who basically defended himself from almost getting, like, the snot beaten out of him? That is not realistic whatsoever, for one thing. The second thing is, without entirely spoiling the book, is that they tried to add a second climax, which ended up finding out the truth, basically, about how the girl's father actually died in the car crash. Like, again, I'm not trying to spoil anything for those of you who want to read this book. Like, I'm not telling you that you shouldn't, but then again, basically on how shitty the second half turns out, maybe you shouldn't to save your lives, but... But that plot point ended up being revealed, and it's supposed to be a plot twist. And, and, it and then it leads to basically the young adult cliche in romance novels of... Oh, there's an understanding, so basically the two main leads are not going to talk to each other until some source of miracle comes along to that'll put them back together again. I get, I get why the cliche is there. Because it's supposed to be one of those, like, obstacles that would get the couple to get back together. But why so late in the book and after another giant plot point that could have been what broken the two up in the first place because it was kind of the girl's fault that this guy was getting his body beaten into shreds in the first place? I felt as if the second plot point could have been also in the middle of the first climactic plot point, so it could have added more tension. But no, the writer didn't decide to do that. She decided to put it at the very end of the book for some odd reason to prove that Apparently, even though the girl basically saved him and fixed her mistake, that he still thinks it's still her fault and that she should still not talk to him again. I mean, what part of that makes any sense? Zero. But as far as reading the worst young adult novels concerned, what to say next doesn't beat this book that I read for this project called Forever Mine. And just by that title alone, you know it's going to be bad. So in this book, it has the main lead, who's a girl this time, whose mother got arrested for, I don't think they really explain why, but it just so happens that her mother's arrested. So the mother tells her that she has to go live with her relatives in somewhere in California where she actually lives in somewhere in Arizona. However, the daughter doesn't want to because she'd rather stay at her normal school life and if anything she could have lived with her best friend and his family because they were really close to her family on the Arizona side so it would make more sense. However, the mother says, no, you have to live in a very stable home, and so I suggest go moving out with your aunt, uncle, and cousin in California. So, that happens. She moves to California, and she's gonna complete, like, some of her schooling until her mom gets out of jail. Which, in itself, makes sense. So, of course, she's hating her school life in California, because she's kind of outcasted for being the new student. And apparently she's growing up in a town where it's a very Latin American community. So I'm assuming because she's, I think she's half white, half Latin American, that she may be outcasted because of that. But it's not really mentioned per se. So I can't really make that argument. But she's just outcasted in general. And the only friend that she really had is her cousin. However, 
at a party one night, she meets one of the most popular boys in school. And he somewhat has interest in her because she's hot. She's mysterious. I don't know. It's a stereotypical, like, ooh, this girl's interesting because she's new. I'm going to go after her. Not saying that's a bad thing, but that's usually very cliche as well. But then here's the zinger about this guy. He apparently doesn't believe that friendships between a guy and a girl can happen. You heard me right, folks. He doesn't think a guy and a girl can be friends without friends with benefits. Or in some way, shape, or form, if one of them's in a relationship that it's possible that they're gonna cheat on the person they're dating with the person they're friends with. Again, welcome to 2017. The last time people thought that was probably the 1960s or the 1950s at the earliest. Because after from that point on, no one gave a shit. And now you're asking, Caitlin, why is this a problem? Well, do you remember the very slightly hinted um, gender of the best friend from back home for the main lead I was talking about? Yeah, he is a guy. And he has been best friends with this girl since childhood. And from what I'm concerned, they've done absolutely nothing until there's uh, something happens, but that's a spoiler warning. He, she basically can't tell this guy that she's suddenly become interested in because he found interest in her the truth about her best friend from back home or else God knows what's gonna happen. My advice to those people who are stuck in that situation if that so happens is if a guy has the mental stigma of a man from the 19th or 20th century, you need to get the fuck out of there. I, I mean, it doesn't matter whether this guy is like super intelligent in school or he's on like some sports team or whatever. It doesn't matter how much he loves the rest of you. If he can accept, cannot accept the people who are important to you in your life, he should go fuck himself. And yet this story acts like it's completely okay to lie to your significant others about your personal life and that you should basically throw yourself at a person who doesn't love everything about you. You can just throw that all away and basically make them happy the best way you can. And if all of a sudden they find out the truth, you're supposed to go down on your knees and beg like a servant. Fuck you, person who wrote Forever Mine. This is not even mean-spirited as a word I would use for scenarios like this. This is like downright, like, original hunchback of Notre Dame, bottle of, bottom of the barrel, evils of humanity bad. This, oh my god. I don't know why I ended up reading this book. I was researching, um, young adult novels for, um, female leads, strong female leads or, like, whatever. And it turned out the book was free on Kindle, so why the fuck not? But by the way, that turns out to almost be the worst idea if you're if there's a Kindle book that's free and you want to read it for the sake of that. I mean, I'm not saying that all free books from Kindle are bad, but that should have been warning number one. This book made me so mad at these two characters because on the one hand, the guy could have been a lot more liberally minded He's 17. This is 2016, probably, when the book was written. He should not determine people's decisions about what friends they have to make. Because even with his little sister, when she has a crush on one of his friends, he's like, oh no, if someone wants to date my sister, they have to go through me. I mean, I get it's stereotypical and it kind of makes sense, but that it was said that this guy has both his mother and father. They can take care of it. He doesn't have to do anything. And he has an older brother, who also does not give a crap. And why is he the only person who actually gives a crap about what what people people should be hanging out with? And on the second hand, you can say that the girl has some problems. Because she can be the one who actually stands up for herself the very moment that 
he actually says this stupid crap. But then again, there's also the argument of, oh, her mother just went to jail and maybe she's feeling a little insecure and weak. Even if someone's parent ends up being locked up, that doesn't derive a person of their moral values. I think that would have made this main female lead actually attack him, her boyfriend, further on the point of how guys and girls can actually be friends. But no, she did, she's, oh my god, she's so pathetic. She's so pathetic that it actually made me want to punch a wall of how stupid she is. And if anyone in this book had any common sense, it was the best friend. Like, he was the one who actually had to fix everything, which he shouldn't. Because usually in books like these, it's the main leads who find out the, the lesson at the end of the story. But no, he had to teach it to the both of them because both of the main leads are, are so incapable of thinking that they need a person who's of their age with a more mature mindset to tell them that this is wrong. And not only that, they had to add in another like pointless plot point to prove that, oh, they deserve each other. No, they don't. They didn't from the get-go. No, they did not. So by reading those two books, they made me realize why did I hate some popular young adult novels that came out when I was in my high school or middle school career. And the three series that I can come up are Twilight, Hunger Games, and Divergent. With Twilight, everyone knows that Twilight sucks. is because I feel so bad for Edward because he has to suffer with a boring female lead such as Bella. Like, I think the movie ruined it for me when I saw it for my birthday. It was not my decision, it was my mother's. Kristen Stewart had no personality in that movie. Like, absolutely none. Every line delivered was like she did not want to fucking be there. Even in the book, from what my sister told me, because I avoided the book for the sake of my own, for the sake of my own sanity. And she told me that even in the book, and Bel Bella was so incompetent. It's like, in human form, she had no opinions on anything. It's like... Oh, you guys are vampires? Cool, I guess. I'm like, honestly, if I found out someone was a vampire who saved me from getting hit by a goddamn car, I'd be freaking out. But no, apparently the only time she gets any personality is in the fourth book, which everything goes to shit. And oh my god, it's so fucking aggravating. Hunger Games, I would say it's better than Twilight because of... I think the movies, like, hyped it up to make it better than it actually is. But, oh my god, Katniss is not a good character either. Like, in the first book, she is so goddamn whiny. It's like, oh, I hate this about my life because I'm basically living in the projects of this new society. And then, of course, the only time that, sh that ever so changes is when she sacrifices herself to save her sister in the Hunger Games, which basically... People are fighting to the goddamn death in order to prove which part of the project is superior to one another. But that's not even like the worst part of the Hunger Games though, and I'm about to spoil a major plot hole. But everyone has probably read the Hunger Games at this point, they know what happens. Is that the whole as as soon as the series moves on, the whole point of the first book became super pointless. Because in the first book, Katniss joins the Hunger Games to prevent her little sister from going because her little sister happened to be the youngest age that people are to join the raffle or are put into the raffle to the Hunger Games in the first place. And it was just a stroke of bad luck that her name was plucked. So of course, Katniss throws herself in because her sister's, she believes her sister's too young She's going to die young. She's afraid of that. So she throws herself in to basically save her sister's life, which I give props for. 
if it were my little sister, I'd be doing the same thing. But then the third book is published. And we come to find out that during the war in between the projects and the government, the sister who she'd been trying to protect this entire goddamn time dies a harsh death. Are you goddamn kidding me? Are you kidding me? Oh my god, where do I start with that? There are so many things wrong that it should be common sense of... If this happened in the third book, why did the whole series even exist to begin with? And I know, like, the ending of the third book is supposed to be, like, it was supposed to be so, like, sombersome, even, even though, like, all these good things are happening now, like, it's supposed to be still sad because Katniss is standing over her sister's grave. But that should not be the ending either! I don't know what to say, really, because it's things like these, these writing choices, that anger me so goddamn much because it's like, if we're not gonna get from point A to point B, why does the story even exist? Like, what's the whole entire message? What's the point? And I think the message of the Hunger Games was supposed to be like, like um, this sudden form of government was going to fail because of such and such. But, oh my god. The whole, like, sister thing, the whole sister thing just totally convinced me not to like the series whatsoever. Like, that was the point where my hope in the Hunger Games of actually being a good series about fighting to the death and such actually was ruined. And then the last series I was talking about, or the last series that I want to talk about, which I actually kind of liked until the very end, is Divergent. Now, don't get me wrong, the whole setup for Divergent is amazing. Like, there's five sectors, or five, like, sub-cities that are account to, or are named after the five different personalities that one person may be the strongest in. And then there's one person who happens to be equal in all five personalities. That's a brilliant idea. I don't know how, if I could ever think of that. That's an awesome idea. However, when we, when we find out why the way the city is built actually exists, even though there is a giant ass war going on, when that's revealed, oh my god, it just turned out to be the most pathetic excuse for a backstory I have ever heard in my goddamn life. But that's not the worst part. Like, I think I can handle the horrible backstory, but no, it's the reversal in character development. Triss becomes a whiny brat later on in the series, even though she is the hero of the story and she's supposed to be the one to fix everything. And all of her independence goes down the fucking window when her love interest all we find out is that he suddenly gets interested in her and he's all like, oh, I want to protect you and everything because I love you so much. I mean, don't get me wrong. Like, supportive partners, I'm all in for. But when he basically does everything for her and she becomes, like, so codependent that she almost cannot think on her own without him being at her side, why does this series exist either? The first book was so good. We had so much character development. What the hell happened? Well, when the series ended, I'm like, thank God. Because the, and plus when the first Divergent movie came out, I think everyone knew that the series was going to, go to the series was going to go down the shitter anyway, was because they know how the rest of the books are going to go, and they're like, why would the movies, like, portray as horrible of story elements like that? And when it turned out that the rest of the Divergent series was going to be um, on Netflix, it did not surprise me at all. It really did not. Because I'm like, yeah, the first book was great, and the first movie would probably be just as great, even though it wasn't. The rest of the movies were going to be done for. The difference between that and Twilight was is that when the Twilight series made 
a whole lot of money with the first movie. They were like, oh, we have enough to do more. But with Divergent, it did not have the budget or the money to or the profits to save it for the rest of the two films. It just didn't. So now thinking about that, I'm now thinking, were there any books that were to save the young adult genre for the better? Were there going to be any books that I found that were going to save it? Well, that's when I found two books here at my school library that was going to change my opinion. The first one is called The Female of the Species, which title was inspired by the famous Ruyard Kipling quote, The female of the species is de more deadly than the male. Or something like that, I can't remember from the top of my head, but you get the idea. And this book is not exactly a romance as the others, but it was more kind of a mystery and a drama. But with those genres, it actually made the book a lot more dynamic and a lot more um, progressive for especially the female characters, which we come to be used to as the Mary Jane or like the plain Mary Jane or the uh, like the wimpy female character who always needs a man to get what she wants. But in this book, that's not the case. Because the main character of the book did not need a man to accomplish her goal, which had already been accomplished in the first half of the book. The book is about um, how this one girl is ostracized for being a violent type because when her older sister was killed, the killer actually walked away free. Like, he didn't go to jail. And this angered her to no end because, of course, when your sibling is brutally murdered and they did absolutely nothing wrong and the killer ends up walking free, how are you going to let that go? So, of course, what does she do? She goes after the killer himself and she basically ends his life in the woods. We, like, I'm not spoiling anything. We knew that straight from the beginning. And the rest of the story is basically about this girl trying to live the rest of her life with this weight on her shoulders. But then she uses her violent power, strength, for the better good rather than being like Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Like, I expected this to be a Jekyll and Mr. Hyde story, but it, no, it didn't. It didn't end like that at all. Because eventually, she becomes friends with the preacher's kid at the school, which, if you know the, the preacher's kid stereotype, they could either be pure as shit or rebellious as fuck. And, of course, it's the rebellious as fuck type of deal. But, of course, she teaches her that... Being rebellious from, like, your family's, um, position in the society is fine. Like, you're all, you're graduating from high school, like, you're free to do whatever you want, but however, you can't be rebellious to the point that you're basically going to let people treat you like garbage, which was what the, what the preacher's kid was almost doing to herself, and, of course, Alex basically had to save her life a couple times. Because even, even though she did want to be rebellious, rebellious from the church that her family works at, because the pastor's her father, she was treated like a sack of potatoes the entire story. Like, even though she, like, wanted to go to, out to party or, like, stay past curfew, she lets even men treat her like shit because... She can't really um, find out how else to rebel than from being, like, pure, holy, then following the rules. But then Alex is like, you don't have to follow all the rules, but you gotta treat yourself better than that, girl. And that's what I love about the female of the species. It finally has strong female characters who can actually teach lessons rather than being taught the lesson. And that's really important, especially if we're going to treat females as equally as males in modern society. Like, in the age we're in right now, that's seriously important. And then the second book that I read 
was called Holding Up the Universe. And this is actually a romance drama, but this actually finally does it right. For one thing, both of the main characters are not popular whatsoever. Even though the guy might consider himself be, but he doesn't consider himself that at all because of a disability that he got from a falling off the roof accident. So, I mean, but we'll get to him when we get to that. So we have the main lead who, main lead girl, who is very socially outcasted because she's overweight and there was a news story where she was so fat at one point that she couldn't even get out of her house, which, holy shit, I cannot imagine being in that position right about now. It's actually really terrifying. I'd be terrified along with her. However, instead of like falling back on her past, she tries to do better for herself. Like she wants to be on the drill team. Like she really wants to be a person who will inspire other people to basically be themselves, even though like she's being bullied by almost every single goddamn person in the school. And even though this bullying situation was almost like what I mentioned in What to Say Next, at least this school is a lot more realistic on how they dan deal with those situations. And I will get to that when I get to that. Then we, set, then we see the male main lead, who's outcast- not- he's not really outcasted, and if anything, he's actually, like, pretty popular. But what makes him so different is that he is a minority of race, being- African-American, and like I said, he's trying to hide this disability that he got from a accident when he was younger. Oh my god, I cannot pronounce the entire full name, but it's the condition where um, you can't recognize faces. Like either like you can't remember someone by their own face or you think every face looks the same to you, that kind of thing. And I wish I could pronounce it, pronounce the full title for you, but I just can't, and I don't have the actual copy of the book with me. I actually just returned it to the library a couple days ago. But yeah, you have both characters who have a flaw that almost defines them by society, but they're trying to divert themselves away from that. So how they meet is where it gets kind of stupid, but at the same time it teaches the both of them lessons that they're going to be following out through the rest of the book. There was this game that their school liked to play called Fat Girl Rodeo, and yeah, I hope you know where this is going. So apparently his, the main guy lead's friends try to convince him, oh, come on, play. Oh, go after the main female lead, because she's, she used to be the fattest teen in America. And that's the actual title that they give her in the book. It's even in the summary. So, because for some odd reason he doesn't want to lose and he's trying to keep up his reputation to divert from his mental condition, he was like, okay, and he goes after her. And, however, instead of the girls trying to run away as what the expected result would be, this girl beats the living shit out of him for touching her. And they both get sent to the principal's office. One for sexual assault and two for... Self-defense assault. Because this girl said, and she says herself, she didn't feel like sexually violated because he didn't touch her in the usual private parts. I hope that did not get me um red flags for saying that. Even though, even though um she wasn't touched that way, according to her, she said she still felt violated enough to the point where he knew what his intentions probably were, and he, she was going to teach him a lesson, which, kudos to you. Kudos. And, and in the guy's case, this was like, yeah, what he knew what he did was shitty. And throughout the whole book, he was trying to make up to her for that because he knew he did something shitty because he wanted to hide something within himself. Like, he wanted to prove to his friends that he had nothing bad to hide. And this is where we get two di finally dynamic characters that actually have some sort of flaw and they know what they're doing is bad and they're not stubborn about it. But they're learning through each other that, yes, they can see past that 
And, and if they can get over those obstacles, they can actually find a way to either be friends or even be in a closer relationship. And no, I am not condoning that touching a girl in any way, shape, or form without her permission gets you, like, any romantic satisfaction. I am not saying that. And he even said himself, he keeps apologizing to her, and he even apologizes to her father about what he did because he knew what he did was stupid, he doesn't want to do it again, and he said the last thing he wanted to do was to hurt anybody. And, I mean, I don't know how the dad actually manages to, to, to say, okay, you can go on a date with my daughter, but if that didn't happen, we would not get a story, would we? But with those two books, we finally get to see some dynamic characters in young adults' novels, which are finally not the stereotypical, like, cliche character traits. Because I feel like in a young adult, we don't really get much character development. We just get... The only thing I can think of is, like, moe stereotypes. But I know that's a more, like, anime-focused term rather than American filmmaking or book literature, like, terms. But now that I think about it, there, I don't think there's any other word for it, too. Because even in the young adult spectrum of literature, moe stereotypes actually do exist. Like, you have the, like, popular, like, slutty bitch, or you have, like, the new, like, studious shy girl, then you have, like, the popular guy, popular guy who kind of doesn't like his popular status, but, but he falls in love with the shy girl, that you have the bad boy who falls in love with the good girl, like, you have all those stereotypes, and they do fa fall onto the same plate, the same moe plate, as, like, the moe stereotypes, where you get, oh, you get the tsundere, who's, like, the the very bitchy girl who ends up, like, falling in love with the main lead, but she can't really say anything. You also have, like, the very, very, very studious girl who's, like, super quiet. And they usually don't. They they look like, basically, they don't want to be there. Like, they have the resting bitch face all the time. They just don't want to be there. Then you have the, um, very, um, kind of shy, but also very caring, like, girl character. And then... Then you have the Psycho Yandere, who will literally kill for their lover. Even though those are, like, two different mediums, the stereotypes are almost the same, besides the, um, Yandere thing. Like, Yonder- I don't think Yanderes exist that much in American literature. But it's these stereotypes that unfortunately keep the genre going, because they're the most recognizable in- for some reason, teenager personality. But even though humans in general, our personalities are not focused on one trait or else we'd be super boring. And that's what happens if you give characters a one trait that they hopefully can remember besides giving like different names to different characters because then that makes our story super boring, it makes the character super boring and it makes them look pathetic. To come back full circle for what I hope I would be writing for my book is that my characters will be dynamic enough that they can actually help teach lessons to people rather than having them being taught lessons and that and have what their failures are what they're supposed to teach the readers. Because, I mean, I know that's what has been done in very old literature and I kind of get why writers did that in the past. Because they say, oh, if you end up on the road you're doing, you're going to end up like this character. You're probably going to end up dead. Which, of course, if you read, like, the Brothers Grimm fairy tales, that are very notorious for doing that. But the problem is we're in a new age. We're in a new era where characters are written to relate to the readers. It's like, even though the characters are not exactly us in person, but we can connect with them enough that we could probably fit in their bodies as we're reading the book. And that's the more modern mentality when it comes to writing the novel. That's what I'm hoping I can do, because I don't want to end up being the same old writer who can't write teenagers properly. I mean, we were all teenagers once. How can we forget what we were like at one point? It's, it's stupid. Like, but if you don't know, like, 
talk to a teenager and talk about like what they experience in their everyday lives. Maybe they won't exactly like come forth to you, but that's also another like dynamic personality trait. Probably is because maybe they do have things to hide because they're that insecure. And what I'm hoping for the future of young adult literature is that we can actually write books that don't make teenagers hate reading because they need people and characters who can understand what they're going through. And they don't want characters that go from point A to point B just because of some, like, miraculous coincidence. Like, they need more real-life scenarios. And that's what I hope I can get out of this. I guess that's it for my rant for the day, and hopefully you guys can take something out from this little, like, discussion. Like, if there are points that you agree with me on or don't agree with me on, like, feel free to share in the comments section. Like, I love to have this conversation go further. I'm Kate Sharon, it's been real. Ciao!